thank you so much for for entertaining our request to join us. Well, in this interview. I, I appreciate that, and I'm I'm very very humbled. Um, it it I enjoy following you guys as well. Um, so you know, thank you, thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I just hope that you know through this meeting and stuff that we can um, you know have some fun and. I can, you know, share what I feel and people benefit from that. So um, I appreciate that. It's very nice to meet you guys as well. <laughs> yeah. So, by the way, I'm Tristan. My partner's name okay. is Rebo. He's on the guy in the other line. Uh, okay. he, yeah. So, so basically what I wanted to, let's, can we kick it off by telling us your story? I want to hear your story on how you got into this whole detailing thing, how you got into the yeah. industry. And uh, how's it going so far? Yeah, um, you know, I, I can get pretty long winded on a lot of things. So I'll keep this part really short. Um, you know, so um, I started, you know, Insane Paint Auto Detailing will be eight years old uh, coming up in February. Um, so just, you know, just shy of eight years. And um, I was doing fashion retail before then. Um, there's a uh, a company here in the United States that, um, has been around for a long time. Uh, it's called The Buckle, and I was with them for 15 plus years. And um, I'm originally from Minnesota, but I grew up in Kansas. And um, so I started working for The Buckle in Kansas. And, um, you know, I had a long run with them. And, you know, there were some changes within the infrastructure of that company. Well, not even the infrastructure, but just in the way that they structured the way that they do business and stuff. And, um, mm -hmm. For a couple of years, I really tried to make the changes and evolve with the company and the way that they wanted the direction that they were going. And I kind of fell out of love with it. I really thought that I was going to retire with that company. And towards the end, you know, and I had been detailing for a long time, uh, you know, just for myself and for friends and stuff like that. Probably how I would like to think that probably how most detailers start, you know, they they do it on the side, right. As a side hustle or yeah, as a supplementary yeah, yeah. income or whatever. And, um, I wasn't mm -hmm. doing it for a supplementary income, but I was definitely doing it on the side. Well, before I started my own business, I had played around with polishers and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, towards the end of my, my run with my previous career, I just kind of fell out of love with it. And I started, it became a point where I'd be mm -hmm. at my job and hours into my shift, I was more excited to get home and detail something than I was to be at my job. And so when I started having mm -hmm. those feelings on a very regular basis, I realized that it was time to do something. And i had always told myself that if I retired with that career, that I was going to either do something in music and not, <laughs> not on the musical side, because I'm, I'm not talented with any <laughs> sort of instrument, but like, you know, with the promotional side of things, but I wanted to do something either in the music industry or is going to be for myself. And so obviously, because I didn't have any connections in the music industry, you know, I was just like, all right, it, this has got to be for myself. It was a real easy decision what I was going to do. And so that's what it was. It, it was detailing and, and, and that's, so that's how it started. And, but it was really difficult because, you know, it's, you know, when a lot of people, you know, I don't know how it is down there, but you know, for a lot of people in the United States, um, you uh -huh. know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it is, you know, throughout your life, you know, you go to school, you go to college, you get the career, you know, you get the house, you get mm. the dog, you get the wife, like it's a very, it, very structured, you know, type of deal. And so for somebody at the age of 38 to just go, you know, to leave that sure thing, you know, and it was, it was a strong six figure income. It was healthy. There's a great 401k, incredible insurance. Like it was a mm. strong career. So it wasn't just a matter of like, Hey, I don't like this anymore. I'm going to go do this. Although I would say for a lot of mm. people, their decision should be that simple. For me, it wasn't that simple. And my mm. wife was pregnant with our first child at the time. So, oh, okay. um, so it was, you know, there were, it, it was a difficult decision, but it was one that I knew that I had to make. And so there you have it. That's mm -hmm. kind of the short version of it. Um, but that's yeah. how it happened. That's kind of how it happened. Uh, that okay. was almost eight years ago. <laughs> so basically for most people here in the Philippines, right? Uh, most shops or most retailers kind of went through the same thing. I mean, me and Rebel, we were both 
uh, graduate. We graduated from school. We were taught to do this, this, and this, and then have the have the family, have a job, have a family, have have a stable income, right? Yep. So be uh, well. There was a certain standard that you were held on to, and uh, we kind of we kind of agreed that we weren't really happy or we weren't we weren't really uh, fulfilled with what we were doing. By the way, for those, uh, if if I should tell you, I'm I'm also a licensed engineer. Uh, I was I was wow. working for a telecom. I was working for a telecoms company for four years, and then I just suddenly realized that I was dragging myself to work. I wasn't really excited to go to work. I wasn't really. I was really looking forward to the weekend, taking vacations and whatnot. I was really yeah. in that sort of mode. And for Rebo, I think he was kind of in the same boat. I was growing uh, chickens for a living. Then, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was doing poultry. Uh, he was really uh, a structured lifestyle. And uh, we both agreed that we enjoyed cars. We enjoyed cleaning cars. We were both in, in that mindset. So it only made sense for us to put up a shop, put up a detailing business, uh, endorse some products. Uh, it just made sense for us. And now we're, we're doing it on our own. Uh, we're, we're doing it on our own. And we're, well, I would say I'm happy. I don't know about this guy, but mommy, I'm personally, I'm happy. I'm, I'm excited to go to work even on Sundays, man. Are you kidding? I hate it, I hate it here. <laughs> well, you know, you said something right there, man, that, that, that I want to comment on is, is, you know, you said it was a very structured life and, you know, it's, you know, the way that you guys were living and where you were working and your day to day and all of those things. And I think part of the exciting part about, you know, being able to do what we do and start the business and, you know, go out mm -hmm. on your own is to be able to create your own structure. So instead of being structured by someone else, you know, to be able to create your own structure. And I think the thing that's been really fun for me as well is, you know, we're a very small team, but we're a team of seven. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, me and the guys that are all the guys that are here is, you know, they have a say so in the structure. They have a say so in like mm -hmm. whether it's a procedural thing or a product thing or an organizational thing or, you know, an op an operations thing or whatever. So it's it's really neat to be able to take and create your own structure and mold it like clay and, you know, really heed the advice of your, you know, your fellow colleagues and stuff like that. And so there's a lot more honor and a lot more pride and a lot more nobility and a lot more ownership when you get to say, Hey, instead of being structured by something else or by something that somebody else has shared with me, how I've got to live or how I've got to do business or whatever, I get to be the one in control. And um, that's a pretty rewarding mm -hmm. feeling. So kudos to yeah, you it guys. Is, it is. It is. So basically, I wanted to well, I wanted to talk to you about the mindset and all of this, right? I wanted to, to say we 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 sort of have the same problems uh, when dealing with the day to day of the business and talking with clients and talking with their staff and all that. So uh, I wanted to 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 get in touch with. You see, I've been reading a lot of your captions. I, I've been commenting a lot on your captions. I really, really admire the way you you uh, uh, you talk. I mean, when you put captions in your work, uh, I really admire it and really inspires me. So I wanted to get to know the mindset in all of that. How are you? How do you come up with those stuff? As an owner, well, as the main practitioner. Well, so a lot of it for me is I'm very vocal. So there's number one. <laughs> okay. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm number <laughs> one, uh, that, that I, I'm, 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 I'm very vocal. Number one, number two, I wear my heart on my sleeve and number three, I'm not scared to talk. And so mm -hmm. you take a lot of those things and you put them together and, and that's kind of how they come about. Um, most of the captions that I put in, you know, the things that I put on social media, whether I'm talking about a vehicle, I'm talking about a moment that I'm going through, I'm talking about being a business owner, um, I'm talking about being a family man, you know, and the patriarch of my home. 
Um, whatever it is, it's usually because I'm either experiencing something in that moment or I am uh -huh. feeling a certain way about an experience that I had a long time ago and I'm reflecting on that or mm -hmm. I'm just sharing what's on my mind. And, you know, a lot, I, I don't want to say a lot of the stuff that I share isn't so glamorous, but I'm always very honest in my captions and in my posts because the thing that's going on in the world today, at least in the United States, um, you know, again, I can't comment for the Philippines, but when you get on social media, everybody's posting all their best stuff. Um, and, yeah. and you're going to have to forgive me if, if I curse a little bit. I, I want to say that um, <laughs> when, I, when, when, I get, when I get going on stuff, yeah, I get fired up speaker fucking I mind, man. curse a little bit. So I hope I don't offend anybody. Um, but no. everybody's always posting their best stuff. They're always... Oh, look at what I did and look at what I accomplished and look how perfect my life is. And I can't stand that <laughs> shit. I can't stand. It's good. It's not because I'm not happy for people, but it drives me crazy because everybody paints this picture that they're so perfect or everything is so great. When all around the world, everywhere, every, so, every post, every day, people are hurting or people are going through stuff. And so when I post and I share myself or what's going on with insane paint, I, when, it, when I share what's going on with the world, I want them to know how real it is and how authentic it is. And like, hey, things are fine, but here's how I'm hurting. Or this is what we're going through as a business right now. And, mm -hmm. you know, people need to understand that, you know, when you're trying to, to work out the whole semantic of being a father and a husband and a business owner and a leader for your crew, that it's not easy and that it's difficult and it's okay yes. to show yes. the color of that. And it's okay mm -hmm. to let the emotion of that out and to, for, to let people in a little bit on that. And I think that does a few things. Number one, I think it's very, very therapeutic for you as the person sharing that information. It's a way for you to get stuff off your chest a little bit and go, oh, I feel a little bit better. Number two, I think it's yeah. great for people that are receiving that to be able to go, oh my God, he's going through that too. I thought I was the only one, or I thought I was the psycho. Mm -hmm. I thought I was the one that was weird for feeling that way. It's nice to know that that dude on the other side of the country or the other side of the world or whatever is going through that. That makes me feel a little bit more normal. And now I don't mm -hmm. feel so psychotic. And number yeah. three, the other thing that I think that is really good about it is from your client's perspective, because I have to be honest, the majority of the time, 99% of the time when I put stuff on social media, it's for a client. It's not for, yeah. I, don't get me wrong, Tristan. I'm glad that, that we're connected and I think technology is really cool and I'm very blessed and honored. Yeah, and yeah. I think this is so super awesome that we're able to do this. But when I post on social mm -hmm. media, it's not for you. It's not for a detailer in you know, Wyoming. It's not for a detailer yeah. in the UK. <laughs> I am posting because... I want my clients to see that, right? I'm hoping that yeah. when a client, somebody who wants to do business with me lands on my page, that they feel mm -hmm. I'm very transparent, very authentic. And let's be honest, a lot of people want to feel connected. Like, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with Walmart, right? The big worldwide yeah, superstore yeah, retailer. Yeah. Okay, so... When people do business with a small business, they want to feel connected. Like a lot of times when people do business with a small business, they get, if, if, if that small business is successful, people get to look at that and go, hey, I do business with them. They're doing good because I play a small role in that. They're doing good because I got my car detailed there. I bought products there. I'm wearing mm -hmm. that company's t-shirt right now. People yeah. want to feel connected to that. So the, 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 I'm getting to something is that third and that final reason in the way that I post that I do is because it allows our clients to really feel connected to who I am as an individual. And when they bump into me out in public or when I see them or run around town or whatever, they're not getting some false persona of like, well, that's who he is online, but man, he's totally different in person. When people meet me, when they come into the shop and they say, hey, man, mm -hmm. I've been following you on Instagram for six months and I'm so excited to finally get my car done with you. They already know who I am because they've already gotten to know me on YouTube and how personal my posts are on Instagram. And they've seen my things on Facebook and stuff like that. So 
that's why I post the way that I do and why I share myself the way that I do, because it's not always glamorous. It's not always perfect. Not and always... people need to know that. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Whether you're a detailer or whether you're a client, people need to feel the emotion and, and, the, and the way that you feel about doing business and when it's good and when it's not so good. And when it's a ton of fun and when it's really, really hard, they need to be able to see that. And I think the better that you can translate that to the world, the more real everything yeah. is. And we, you can be one of those individuals that penetrates the fake bullshit and people really get to see something mm -hmm. genuine. And that's really, really fun to be able to do business with people like that. So that's yeah. my long ass uh, answer to that question about where <laughs> the captions come from. <laughs> I'd like to, I just well, like yeah. to say that I've been smiling for the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, whole, the whole time you were talking, because yeah, that's it. That's well, pretty much what we're all yeah, yeah. Um, going through. Yeah, that's awesome. well, well, that's I gotta. Great. I love the I love the term though. I love the term authentic, and then genuine. Well, I I really love that term. Uh, I do have a confession to make. Sometimes I kind of uh, copy <laughs> the captions from from your page. I kind of change some words a little bit, but. Yeah, I'm guilty, man. Uh, I love it. You, All good. You say the good words. You say the the hard hitting words, and sometimes that's what I feel. Sometimes that's good. I get I get a lot of crap from some people who calls me up sometimes who ask me if I'm if I'm fighting somebody or if I'm I'm yeah. saying stuff to, towards somebody. So sometimes yes, <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no, but. Basically, I agree. Uh, sometimes when you post something on social media, it's how you say the stuff uh, through the captions. Sometimes it's a reflection of how you're feeling during that time or during that situation, right? right. So I agree, I agree. I really love the, those terms, right? Uh, genuine, be genuine, be authentic. It's not always yeah, I, glamorous. It's not always I, perfect. I, I know what you mean. I, I Sometimes I'll post stuff and some of my good friends, they'll DM me and they'll be like, hey, man, you okay? Like, is everything all right? Or, <laughs> I, I've, got a, I've got a few guys who are like, whose ass I need to kick right now, man? Is somebody messing with you? And I'm like, no, 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 it's not like that. You know, it's – it's and so, you know, it is kind of funny on that term. But, again, you know, some of those things, like sometimes when I post or when I share stuff like that, Sometimes I'm looking back on something that happened a year ago, two years ago, four years ago, five years ago, and I realize in a moment that I've evolved and I've changed so aggressively from the person that I was back then that I'm posting it because I'm, I'm looking back on it, not to reminisce or not to, you know, woes me or anything, but to like almost like pat myself on the back like, Chase, you've changed so much or you've gotten so much stronger from where you used to be. And so sometimes the post is about that. I've also had on the mm -hmm. flip side of that, I've had people DM me or text me or whatever, be like, man, I really don't think you should share things like that because from a client's perspective, it kind of looks like you're complaining about other people. And I get where, yeah. you know, you're complaining about other people or you don't need to air your drama or whatever. Well, first of all, it's not drama. I'm 45 years old. I don't have any time for drama and I don't, I don't have any time for that high school bullshit. So it's not about drama, but I would say that the people that either don't like or get offended or whatever it might be when I have certain things to say about certain experiences in my life, well, you, the, good, the cool part is, is you don't have to read it. You don't have to follow me. You can just like a TV, you can change the channel if you don't like what you're watching. But the way that, that I'm wired is I like being able to share those things. And I have found in the long run, in the near eight years we've been in business, is that when I post stuff like that, the 99% of people that enjoy those posts, that thank me for them, that say that touched me or I feel that or I'm going through that, thank you, that far outweighs the 1% of people that are like, I can't believe he said that. So it, <laughs> you know... Um, <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm for the majority, I guess, in this case, but, um, but yeah, those yeah, posts are yeah. heartfelt because I'm, I'm very vocal and, and because I like sharing the, the, you know, the not so cool stuff. Um, if you want to watch a highlight yeah. reel, you know, go to somebody else's page, but that's, that's not how I want to post. So, yeah, well, well, this is, 
well, we, we're detailing cars. It's basically a very, very dirty job. So some posts, you, uh, you see this obviously on some pages that uh, their shop's so clean, it's so, so pristine, so neat. And it's just not believable, man. Yeah, and you wonder, like, what kind of work do you do there? <laughs> yeah, it's so clean. It's not really reflecting the hard part of what we do. It's not really showing that 99% of the time the shop is a mess. 99% of the time it's, there's bottles here, there, there's towels here, there, and everywhere. So we try to keep it as clean as possible, but 9 out of 10 times it's not that situation, right? So, so I, I definitely have a comment on that. So you're, you're definitely right. So when I think about, you know, the workings of, you know, everything day to day, right? You're, you're exactly right. Throughout mm-hmm. the course of the day when there's vehicles being moved, like, for example, so we've got, we've got, it's one big facility, but it's two shops, right? Side by side. And so we've yeah, got one yeah. shop that where is where all the dirty work is. And then the other shop is where the coatings and the PPF and all the clean work. So, you know, no yeah. dust and stuff like that. Right. So mm-hmm. there's cars being moved around. So if we have a car coming out of the dirty shop into the clean shop, a car coming out of the clean yeah. shop, going home, um, you know, a car that is in the clean shop, but it needs to be moved from PPF and it needs to be moved over so we can code it. Um, Cause we got another car going in PPF cause we got another car going in for correction or whatever it might be. You know, there's things moving And then outside is typically where we do all of our decontamination. Now, in our climate in Alabama, Mm -hmm. for the most part, 90% of the time we can decontaminate a vehicle outdoors. So we're very blessed in that fashion. But every once in a Mm -hmm. while, if it's extremely cold or if it's extremely hot and we've got, you know, direct sun out there, we do have to decontaminate a vehicle indoors. So you've got all the pressure washing, all of the multipurpose cleaners. You've got all of that stuff. And then if the vehicle is super duper hammered, we do a ton of trucks, um, and yeah, so they're just I, bleeding I out all kinds of gunk. <laughs> um, and in our shop, we don't have a floor drain because it wasn't put in in the shop um, and because of where we're located. And um, and so and we don't own the building. So we have never cut into the concrete to create a drainage system because we don't own the building. And so you're right. It's very, very dirty. And when I see a lot of these people shops, um, I do, man, some of these some of these videos and these photos, I'm like, what, how did you, you know, where are you doing your decon? And I mean, their walls are perfectly white. I'm like, man, how much time did you spend organizing your shop before you shot this YouTube video? Now on that note, the guys will tell you, I am even throughout the day, I try to keep things as tight as possible. I don't like, you know, the pressure washer hose and everything all out everywhere, buckets Mm. all out everywhere, just crap everywhere. But if we're working on a family size SUV and half of the interior is gutted and we've got steam cleaner and drill brushes and all that stuff, and it's all over the place, that's just part of the animal at that point in time. But at the end of the day, man, we are, I, I am very methodical about like, listen, man, you know, 30 minutes prior to shutdown, you know, we need to tidy up. All the cords are wrangled up. All everything's put away. Um, so, but yeah, man. It, uh, so I understand mm-hmm. that, and and that's one of the reasons why I don't think I'll ever have a floor like some of these shops. Um, you know, they've got all these super <laughs> nice epoxy floors and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, mm-hmm. But we just do so much super gnarly, dirty stuff, especially if we're doing like a wheels off detail and we're doing it in the shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that just, that stuff just goes everywhere. So we've got a nice, smooth concrete floor. I'd much rather just be able to squeegee that out and not feel like if I'm having to use any sort of acid or aggressive all-purpose cleaner that I'm slowly ruining my floor that I just spent $10,000 on. So um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, definitely a part of doing yeah. some dirty stuff, but um, yeah, yeah but I, I get where you're coming from. Uh, glamour. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, wanted to sure. you though. Uh, it's, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that the shop or your business has been going on for eight years, right? You're, you've been there eight years. How was it during the start? Did you, for example, did you, uh, off the bat, everything that you're offering now, were you offering it eight years back? Uh, eight years so, ago, were you doing that? Now? No. So, so eight years ago, it started in my garage in my neighborhood. And um, I didn't do a whole lot of research whether or not I could detail out of my garage. And um, I think Mm -hmm. one of my 
jerk off neighbors probably called the <laughs> called the city and said, "Hey, I think this guy's running a detailing business because he's detailing, you know, all hours of the day, which in the evening hours I was pretty <laughs> quiet. Um but in the mornings, you know, I would be pretty loud, you know, if I was running a pressure washer and preparing a vehicle and stuff like that. But I always tried to be pretty quiet and make sure that whatever I was doing in the evening, I was in my garage. But I think at some point somebody was like, hey, this guy's running a detailing business. And after about five months, the city came and basically said, you know, you can't be doing this. You're done. And so I had to find a shop. But for that first six months that I was out of my garage, anytime I was doing a heavy paint correction, because I was skilled at paint correction at that point. Anytime I was doing a heavy paint correction, I would typically make sure that that vehicle would come to my house. Anything less than like a two stage paint correction. Like if I was doing any sort of cutting, um, I would want that mm. at my house, any sort of heavy compounding stuff like that. I would want that at my house and I, at my garage, I had the lights set up and it was all super organized and, and, and all of that. I really miss those days because it was one car in, one <laughs> car out, and I had everything just perfect. It was nice and tidy and tight. And I do miss those days. It sometimes I look back and I'm like, God, man, that was so simple. But but anything <laughs> less than that, I would be okay with going mobile. So back back then, I would say probably about 80% of the polishing jobs that I would do, I would do it mobile. I, um, I had a uh, an F-150 at the time and I would just load the truck up and I would go to wherever it was and I would do a nice little one-step polish or an all-in-one polish um, or whatever at that at that client's, you know, business or home or wherever it was. And so, um, so no, I, I wasn't doing a lot of coatings back then. This was eight years ago. Coatings in the United States at that point were around for sure. I did them. But now where we do four to five coatings a week, Back then, I would maybe do, I don't even know if I'd do four coatings a year, you know, for that first oh, year. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it okay. was, you know, mostly, you know, whatever paint correction plus a sealant or a wax or sealant and wax. You know, the, I had different upgradable mm -hmm. options for protection, but I wasn't doing a whole lot of coatings. I understood them, but I don't understand them the way that I do now. So I, I really wasn't even almost bringing them up to clients back then because, um, I wasn't really, truly myself understanding the heavy benefits of ceramic back then. And so when you don't understand something, you're not bringing it up. And if you're not bringing it up, you're not. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're not, you're so, not selling it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, back then, you know, I was barely on Instagram, barely on Facebook, barely, barely. I don't know if I've got any of my old YouTube videos still up on the channel, but I was barely <laughs> on YouTube. Um, so, you know, th there was very, very little, it was existent, but very little social media, but I definitely wasn't doing PPF back then. I shoot two years or three years ago, I would have told you all, oh, I'll never do PPF. So we weren't even <laughs> thinking about doing PPF back then. Um, but it was just myself for the first few months. And then I had, um, a guy join me up in the very beginning. Yeah. I joined up with me in the very beginning. And so it was just us two, um, you know, for a while there. But the majority of it was mobile. Some of it was based out of my garage. Um, it, it definitely took, you know, the evolution of the industry and the evolution of my confidence to evolve very hard into ceramic and um, to evolve very hard into what my online personality looked like. Um, my website has always been really strong and I've always been very vocally prominent on the website and sharing things on the website, but it took probably two full years before I really went hard on social media and went hard on ceramic coatings. Um, two full years. So, um, it's different for guys now because, you know, the thing that I would probably tend to think is for guys starting now is there's a lot of pressure and I would tell them not to worry about that pressure. And what I mean by pressure is it's real easy in a, in a very digital online world to get on Instagram and, and I say Instagram because I think that's where the majority of the detailing community is. I don't think a lot of them are on, you yeah. know, at least not super heavy. They're not on TikTok. If they, and I know there are Facebook groups, 
but I think in order yeah. to be a really strong standalone detailer on Facebook, you would have had to have had your, your page for quite some time. Like for example, on Instagram, we've got over 19,000 followers on Facebook. We've got 4,500, which I think for a standalone detailer is pretty solid, but it's nowhere near the comparison of, of Instagram. And they're two totally different uh, markets. I believe two totally different yeah. sets of people that, that use those media platforms. But anyway, nonetheless, is what I was getting at is for guys that are starting now, I would think there's, you. it's real easy to get online, especially Instagram and feel the pressure, this crushing pressure mm -hmm. of what your business is supposed to look like because everybody's coding this and PPF and that and pulling the wheels off of mm -hmm. this and doing this McLaren and doing this, you know, super high end yeah, yeah, Hellcat yeah. or, you know, there's all this pressure and yeah. everybody's got fancy lights like you've got behind you and, like there's just this this unspoken pressure <laughs> of like, oh man, I've got to be doing this and I've got to look like this and I've got to wear this shirt and I've got to use this brush and if I'm not, yeah, I suck. Yeah, yeah, Let yeah. Me tell I you agree, man. Please don't fall prey to that bullshit. If you are a new detailer right now and you're three months in or a year in or 18 months in, and you're, tr you're still trying to figure out, you know, where am I supposed to come up with the money to afford all these lights and the Kranzel pressure washer and you know, whatever it, yeah. well, he's got a five foot trailer. I need a six foot trailer. And he's got this shelving unit in his trailer that, you know, looks like this and I've got to have that stop all that shit. Just stop it. Like, Please stop. Like, just realize that you are grinding for whatever purpose is important to you, whether it's your family or, you know, your children or to create a legacy in your community and grind for that reason in your heart because you see something bigger and you know there's a greater purpose for you outside of detailing, grind for that reason. Don't worry about all the bullshit that the internet is going to make you feel like you have to have or have to do in order to have a successful detailing business. You could be a dude in your town that has a van with some good quality chemicals. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to shortchange the fact that it's not good to have good tools and good products and good systems and all that. I'm not discounting that at all. Please don't misread what I'm saying. I just don't want people to feel this obligated, this obligation from all these other fancy shops online that they have to some standard to live up to. You could do Maybe you're the interior guy in your town. Maybe you do interiors far better than anybody in your town. And all you do is like wash clay protect packages. You don't have to do paint correction to be a good detailer, to be a successful detailer. You don't have to do, you know, ceramic coatings to be a successful detailer. As long as it takes to do a wheels off detail, paint correction, ceramic coating, you could be a guy in that same window of time that does four wash clay protect interior jobs. And if your prices are right, you could do four of those in the same time. It takes a dude like me to pull wheels off and ceramic coat stuff. And you could make the same amount of money. It's just four appointments as opposed to the one yeah. in the same amount of time. And I think if people can realize that and they can do what matters to them at that moment for their business that makes the most sense and really triple down on that shit. Go hard as hell on that shit and see where it takes you. And then if in a month you need to tweak it and kind of guide yourself and, and your direction changes a little bit, cool. That's great. Then you go that direction and then you triple down on that shit and you go hard as hell in that moment for 60 days, maybe 90 days. And then you reevaluate that. And then it, oh, okay, I need to come back this direction. And now you're over here. And that, that's how a business changes and evolves and grows is you make these adjustments. If you don't make those adjustments along the way, it'd be the equivalent of saying, I'm going to jump in a sailboat and I'm leaving the Philippines and I'm going to sail to Russia and just getting in the boat and going, all right, well, 
I, sh- I hope I get there. I hope the wind carries me in the direction I'm supposed to go. That shit doesn't work. You've got to make adjustments along the way to get where you want to go. So you can't just hop into business and just go, well, you know, I'm crossing my fingers. I'm praying for the best. It doesn't work that way. But if you get in and you go hard as hell with what you have, what you can do, and you're constantly evolving your skill set, you're constantly evolving the products that you use, you're constantly evolving the tools that you use, and you're constantly making those adjustments in where you're headed, you'll get to where you're going and you'll figure things out. You'll, you'll get into chapters of your story. You'll get into chapters of your story that you never saw coming. But because the last chapter was so good, or maybe it was so hard, you, you, you adjust how you write the next chapter. And, and I think that's, I think that's really important. And and sometimes I think people can do, there's two different things. Number one, a lot of times people don't give themselves enough credit and because they don't give themselves enough credit, they're scared to stick their neck out a little bit. That that's where we were with PPF. Dude, we were, we've been, we were in business for six and a half, seven years before I said, okay, I think I, I think I want to do PPF. And I talked myself out of PPF for the longest time because I thought it was too expensive, too hard. I didn't think I could do it you know, all of those things. So number one, I don't think people give themselves enough credit or they don't give themselves enough permission to go, I've earned the right to do this next thing. I've earned the right to start taking wheels off people's vehicles. I've earned the right to start tinting windows. I've earned the right to, you know, use a super high level ceramic and charge more than anybody else in my area is charging. I've earned the right to it because the quality of my work has reached this capacity. So I think a lot of times people, when they're doing stuff, they get in this, this rut and they, they, they have not given themselves permission to really kick open the door and go, I'm going to the next level. And then the second thing Mm -hmm. is, is that because of that, they've, they've, they've kept themselves stuck and they, they, let's say you start out as a wash clay protect detailer because you're not giving yourself permission or you're looking for, you're looking for um, this, these people online to say that you're good enough or certified enough or whatever it is, you just keep yourself in that rut. And I, and I think that's, I think that's really unfortunate. And so, um, so in in a long answer, no, we, what we're doing now, we didn't always do back then, but it's because, Mm -hmm. excuse me, it's because I made these little adjustments along the way that have inevitably over the course of the eight years, all of these little adjustments have led us to where we're at now. And you know what, I, I'll, to end this, to end this question that you just asked seven years ago, I made fun of people like me. Not, not let me re, let me rephrase that. Not made fun. That's not what I meant to say. I, a shop that takes pictures the way that we do, we now have a guy that, handles it when you look at our page it's evolved a lot especially over the past few months the way that we photograph vehicles and the way we capture our media has escalated drastically because we've got a guy dedicated to capturing our work and Mm -hmm. seven years ago when i would be online and i would see shops that do that i'd be like that dude thinks he's fancy shit that dude thinks (laughs) <laughs> that dude, I can't believe that guy's got somebody taking pictures for him. Like, I, I thought it was silly or stupid or like, who needs all that crap? And we've evolved to the point to where now I see, now I am that guy. Now I see it as <clears throat> I've earned the right to have that. I've earned the right to be able to have my business operate at that level and at that capacity. I earned that. We, the team, us, Insane Paint, we've earned that. We've built the right to have our media look the way that it does. And so, and it's because I've made little adjustments along the way. So I know there's people out there right now that probably follow us and they see our posts and they see the things that we do and they go, well, Chase thinks he's cool shit now because he's got a guy taking pictures. No, I don't think I'm cool shit. But I do think it's pretty badass that over the course of eight years, I've built a business to have a guy run my media, 
not run my media because I still run yeah. the content, but have a guy take pictures for us. Yeah. I think that's pretty damn bitching. And we've built that. So for everybody that, you know, sees that, that thinks, I think our shit doesn't stink. That's not it at all. I'm actually still <laughs> more grateful and more humble now than I was seven or eight years ago, but <laughs> make adjustments. Sorry. Make, make adjustments yeah. along the way. Mm. Don't expect God to take you or show you every little nook and cranny of your path. And don't expect your sailboat to make it where you're going without adjusting the sails along the way. So just had something kick on in my shop and it's loud enough to where I couldn't hear what you were asking. Okay, oh, okay, you were talking okay. about pricing. <laughs> yeah, you were, uh, I wanted to ask you about that because uh, as I've mentioned to you before, right? Uh, in our, in when one of our chats, uh, we have shops here in the Philippines uh, that offer a full correction, a ceramic coating, and then they charge it for somewhere around $150 in your money. Is that, it's hard to compete with that. I mean, from don't, where, uh, don't worry about it. Those sons of bitches will be out of business so quick. It's not even funny for multiple reasons. First of all, their clients are going are gonna to see that it's not quality work because anybody working for that type of price on a polish and ceramic coating mm -hmm. is not doing a good job. They're zipping through it so fast. They're not giving them true correction and they're not giving them a well-installed coating. So that's number one. Number two, there's no way that the quality of material that they're using is good because for that amount of money, you know as well as I do, that, that barely covers the cost of the coating kit. I mean, yeah, like yeah. that there's no way. So there's no way they're using a quality polish, a quality towel, a quality coating. There's no way for that amount of money that they're using quality ingredients on any portion of that. And number three, people that do that kind of work for that kind of price will very quickly find out it's not worth their time. In other words, maybe for a while they can do that because People that do that kind of work are living in the short term. They're, they're mm -hmm. looking to get on a train, ride it for a short while, get as far as they can while that train's going. And then when they're sick and tired of it, they're going to jump off. Because for me, I've got a wife and two boys. And so I've got to do certain things that are worth my time to be away from them. I've got to charge a certain amount that says I would rather, and not rather, but I'm okay with doing this kind of work for charging this much because I am going, it, I have to be away from my family to make this money. So mm -hmm. it has, I, it's gotta be worth my time to not be with my family to do a certain type of work. So yeah. anybody charging that kind of money for a polish and coating is going to quickly find out it's not worth their time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, they're going to eventually realize like, I got to stop doing this because I'm not making enough to justify the fact that I'm away from my family or to even get out of bed in the first place. So yeah. places like that, they'll be out of business, man. Don't, don't, I wouldn't, I, I would so not even for the first time ever. It's funny that you asked that. I'm not even kidding you. I wish I would have been here because this guy stopped down on a Saturday when, when the crew was working, our crew works a little bit on Saturdays. Now we didn't always used to. But I, I work on some of them, but not all of them. We had a guy stop down on a Saturday and come up to one of the guys on our team and say, hey, man, um, I got a quote for a polish and ceramic coating for about $150 to $200. Can you guys compete with that? <laughs> and he asked this to one of my newest guys. And even my newest guy looked at me. He said, buddy, we can't even polish your car for that. Like, you know, he was it, so it's so far different yeah. from who we are and what we offer and how we do things. I don't even bother <laughs> myself with the dumbasses trying <laughs> to, it's funny. <laughs> like it's almost comical. So I don't even, those types of shops don't even get mentioned in, in my bit that I don't talk about them. I don't post about them. I don't, yeah. even, and <laughs> I don't, don't think at least right now, I don't think we have, any well clearly somebody is doing it because this guy stopped down but he might have had a friend of a friend who was saying he'd do mm -hmm. it or something but yeah man mm -hmm. um i wouldn't even worry about places like that because people like you 
and people like me that are playing the long game that would rather do quality work for a fair price, for the right price, for an honest price, because you're providing an honest result, we will win in the long term. Those dumbasses charging that kind of price and they're not they're not <laughs> giving anybody near the amount of quality that you will or anybody else that's watching this video. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of shops are not they can't even hold a candle to what yeah. a quality craftsman can provide. So to me, it's not even a discussion. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Uh, some of the shops that I mentioned that were offering that kind of service, some of them actually closed down a long time ago. But these shops keep popping up left and right, man, especially now with the COVID and everything. Uh, yeah, and you know what? Because... <clears throat> You say shops popping up. So I, I do. I call them pop-up shops. Those places are not doing it because they are passionate about it, because they love it, because they're, you know, they love the hustle. They love the procedure. They love the result. They love the interaction with the clients. They love the, you know, they love being able to create something with their hands. They're not doing that because of that. They're yeah. doing that because they're like, I heard ceramic coatings are cool and you can make money doing them. Come on, Steve, let's go open a ceramic coating shop. We'll make lots of money. That's why they're yeah. doing it. They're doing it because they saw an opportunity to make money, not because they're following mm. a passion or because they're following a, you know, a calling to a bigger purpose. They're not doing it because of that. Dudes like you and Rebo, you're doing it for the right reasons, for the right people, for the right price, and because you know you want to leave something behind for your family, um, not because you heard there was an opportunity to open a business and make a few bucks. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we left. I mean, me and Rebel, we left. We left lives for this man. I mean, we left jobs, we left a career, we left careers, and uh, to do this thing, to do the things that we love, right? And hopefully make some bucks out of it, make some a little bit of money out of it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's where we're coming from. So I hey, do. You know what, man? I, I want to say something on that really quick. You know, you you kind of hesitated when you know you were talking about just now when you said you know we do it because we love it because we left this job behind and hopefully make yeah, some money. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's okay. I want to remove this stigma that kind of exists that I see with people in our industry. It is okay to like money. And I, I think a lot of times people don't want to bring it up because they don't want to come across to their clients as money hungry or greedy or, you know, um, a materialistic asshole or something like that. Like they don't want to come across as like, well, I don't want to say this out loud because people might think I'm a money hungry jerk. It is okay to want to to provide nice things for your family and to buy a nice car. Hell, most of us are in detailing because we love cars. Why would yeah. we be doing a detailing business if we didn't eventually want to buy a badass car? That's why yes. we started detailing. Yes. Like, so I just want to, I just had to comment on that. It, I want to remove the stigma like, oh my God, don't talk about money. It's sacrilegious. I don't want it to be misinterpreted. No, we're all in business. Yes, because we love what we do and we're passionate about it and we want to leave a legacy and all that. But let's be honest, man. I'm, I don't want to drive a beat up ass Toyota, you know, 1989 Toyota Camry. I want to drive <laughs> something nice and fun and fast. Yes, and, yes. You know, something that's super bitching at a red light or when you pull into a parking lot, people are like, damn. <laughs> so it's, it's okay yeah, to yeah, say yeah. that, you know, hey, I yeah. want to make good money too. So, <laughs> yeah, we, well, you're probably used to de detailing a lot of good quality cars, man, for sports cars, Ferraris, or whatnot. Yeah, we do uh, occasionally get to work on cars like that. And uh, every every damn time that a uh, car like a good car comes in, we end up talking. Okay, when's when is our turn? When when do we get to detail our our own McLaren or our own Porsche, right? So yeah, we we do want to make. I mean, we do eventually want to own cars like that, right? So that's why we're in yes. this industry. So I do. I did also want to ask you about your clients. I mean, of course, you do have your own clients, right? So uh, how do you manage them? How do you build the trust? 
how do you build how do you manage uh, expectations how do you deal with all that crap and all that all that stuff so um this is you know it, that's a great great question this is where i see a lot of guys in our industry struggle um a lot of guys are you know whether they they come in for our one of our annual events or i meet them as they pass through town or um we haven't trained in a few years i've got my first big training class coming up in a couple of weeks it's our first one in probably two years or three years two or three years um but this is where I find guys hurting a lot is because, you know, helping somebody develop a skill set, typically not a huge issue. Helping somebody, you know, develop a, a, an, an online presence or help them organize their website, typically not an issue. Where it is hard to translate training and to help guys develop is how to interact with clients. Now, I got, excuse me. I got very lucky. Well, I don't want to say lucky. I'm very blessed that God gave me a great vocabulary and he gave me a little bit of stage presence. In other words, I'm not scared to talk to people, talk in front of people, you know, um, engage with people. I'm not scared of conflict or having awkward conversations or anything like that. Um, I feel like I can always explain myself in a very, very proficient manner. So if that's you, that's great. If that's not you, then I would genuinely, instead of taking a detailing training class next year, I would encourage somebody who's not really gifted at talking, either get in touch with me or get together with a speech therapist or so I'm, I'm not joking here. Yeah. I'm being dead serious because if you want to be uber successful and uber trusted with your clients in that relationship capacity, You've got to be able to explain yourself. You've got to be able to explain, you know, the process and the situation with their vehicle in very real terms. And if you can't do that, then you're going to have a very difficult road because if you're the person that is shy or reserved, or let's say, if, I mean, how fun would this Zoom call be if I was talking like this? <laughs> You know, if, if I never really looked at you guys and I was always looking at the floor and I was just doing this, that you probably would have had a million people logged off of this, you know, damn Facebook thing yeah, a long yeah. time ago. And like, man, he seems like a nice guy, but I, I can't, that dude's driving me. I'm bored to death, you know, or how would I ever want to listen to anything this guy is saying? Because the words that are coming out of his mouth don't even seem convicted. Um, yeah. So you've got to figure out a way that, now, I'm not saying you have to be me. You know, yeah. I, I don't want you to be me, but you got to find a way for yourself. You got to figure out what you look like, what you sound like, you know, what your method is, what, what your emotion is, what your version of communication is. So you don't have to be me. You don't have to be, you know, the other guy on YouTube or, you know, anything like that. But you need to find a way for you that works that you can genuinely clarify things with your clients. Okay. So learn to get verbally talented. That that's my first answer. The okay. second answer is the more you can explain things with your clients or discuss things on the front side. And this is where a lot of people go wrong or that the, the part of the equation that gets missed is they talk with client they book the appointment, the car gets dropped off, the service is carried out, and the car gets picked up. And where there can be a disconnect is, is that moment right there when the client is either um, underwhelmed by the results, but it's, it's not because you didn't do a good job doing the detail. It's because you booked them for a certain package and they thought maybe they were getting another package. Or in other words, maybe they thought they they got a package from you that included polishing, but it didn't include polishing. It only included decontamination. And so they thought they were getting swirl removal mm -hmm. and they didn't get swirl mm -hmm. removal. So now they're a little ticked off, but again, it's not because the detailer did a bad job. It's because they didn't, they didn't specify what was getting performed or if maybe the client was under the impression, you, you know, you've heard this before, Maybe yeah. the client was under the impression where clay bar removes swirls or wax yeah. <laughs> removes swirls. 
And so because they thought they were going to get rid of the swirls in their car and now they pick up the car and it was clay bar. It's got yeah. wax on it, but they still have swirls and they're confused yeah. by that. It's because there was lack of conversation on the front side, lack of specification on the front side. So I would really encourage detailers to not only become very verbally talented, but are there packages and are there services very precise on your website or wherever your client finds out about your services or when you wrote them up, like we have a, a write-up sheet in our shop that gets, that gets hand, you know, that gets dealt when somebody comes in for an evaluation or for their appointment are wherever they're, wherever you guys are, you know, communicating your packages or services to the client. Is it very precise on that note? Are you giving a brief explanation <clears throat> to the client about what is being performed? Do they know the difference between a one-step polish and a two-step paint correction? Do they mm. understand the difference between those two things? If they don't, <clears throat> it's not their fault. It's your fault. It's, your fault. it's the detailer's yeah. fault. So a lot of times detailers, see, I can't stand, I, sometimes I'll see detailers post in their stories or sometimes they'll make a post about, oh, my clients just don't understand and my clients they don't get and i think it's hilarious because they don't know what okay well that falls on you jackass like you gotta <laughs> own that like that's your fault because they either didn't get the information from your website or you didn't explain it well enough to them so if your clients don't quite understand what they're getting that is your problem so make sure on the front side as they're dropping the vehicle off or when they're evaluating the car with you be very specific about this is what we're doing. This is what it's going to perform. I straight up tell you have to straight up tell people, okay, I'm cool. Like for, for us, our rejuvenation polish is a one step polish, one step, one and done. We're not chasing rids. We're not going after crazy stuff. We're not sanding out, you know, water etchings or anything like that. It's a one step polish, whatever combination we come up with. And the combination changes, right? The pad, the polish yeah, yeah. that varies a little bit per car. So you can get the best results possible, but <clears throat> this one step polish. Okay. So this is what you can expect, Mr. Jones on your car. If it were me, if, 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 if your car was my car, I would do the next step up. Our, our two step cut and polish is going to get a deeper defect removal and it's going to get a more purified gloss in the end because we're going to remove more defects. That is what I'm, that is what I would recommend. If you don't want to do that for budget reasons, I'm okay with that. But I, I want you to understand the car is still mm. going to look great. A one-step polish is going to make a huge improvement. Yeah. But I just don't want you to pick it up and think it's going to be perfect. Because yeah. a one-step polish is not going to make this paint finish perfect. And the more of those kinds of conversations that you have with your client, then the more the expectations, price, value, end result, um, all of those things come together and there's no more surprises. There's no mm. more like, oh, I can't, I thought I was getting this or no, you didn't say that. Or no, I told you, you know, all <laughs> of those things are removed because you do such a great job explaining, explaining things yeah. when the vehicle is evaluated or dropped off or whatever. So I'll give you a perfect example. We had a guy drop off <clears throat> his car last night for coming up on Monday. It's a really nice GT 500. And um, <clears throat> he came in for the evaluation initially um, when we were, I think it was two and a half months ago, because that's when we were scheduling. And so it's been a couple months since, since we evaluated his car. And the car looks great. He hasn't driven it a whole lot. But we were kind of juggling some things. We knew what polish we were going to do, but we weren't sure on coating. We weren't sure on PPF, you know, those kinds of things. And so, so we had that evaluation. Then I spoke with him a few days ago. Um, and we kind of narrowed some more things down and then he came in today to drop off, uh, yesterday to drop off and we narrowed even more things down. And so now there is no room for error. There is no room for miscommunication or wonderment or anything like that. He knows what he's getting. He knows what he's paying. He knows what's being applied to his car. Um, and so I think that's super important. And, um, so in, in doing that repeatedly again these are small things that we've done for almost eight freaking years years not eight weeks not eight <laughs> months 
and and I think I want to take these two points and, and kind of time together. I want to go back just a little bit. That pressure that sometimes people can yeah. receive from social media is if somebody lands on my page on Instagram right now, it looks like we've always been badass. It looks <laughs> like we've always been like top shelf. Dude, we're first of all, we're still not badass. We're still not top shelf, but it can look that way sometimes. And so sometimes people are like, well, I want that and I want that now. Well, they don't realize that for eight, god dang, eight years, we've been having these very pointed conversations with our clients. Very long-winded, direct. There's been some clients, I know you've had them too. Yeah. Uh, Tristan, where time, you know, it's like the client books the appointment and, you know, let's say you're booking a month out. And within that month, maybe they stop by a couple of times or they send you a few texts or whatever. And you talk to them like multiple times about their service coming up. And then when they drop off, you talk to them again about it. And then even after they drop off, they still have questions and they're texting you about yeah. their car. And <laughs> yeah. it's just like, golly, man, this client is a lot of work. And that's OK, though, because some people need that. Some people need to be babysat that way. They need you to hold their hand a little bit. And maybe it's because. <laughs> You know, they spent a lot of money and a lot of savings and a lot of work to buy yeah. this car. And here they are giving you the keys. <clears throat> and so some detailers might be like, well, golly, I got to put up with this client's shit. They're asking me all these questions <laughs> and they're so hard to work with. Well, yeah, because they've been busting their ass to earn this car. And now they got this car. And now here they are giving you the keys to provide this really high level of detail. They should be nervous. They don't know you. Yeah. And so for eight years we've been doing all of these things and having all of these conversations and that is how trust is earned you don't get the trust of your city your community your state your region your country you don't get the trust of all of those people overnight after three months that is earned day after day week after week year after year so don't think that you can just all of a sudden start doing coatings and you're going to be successful. Don't think that just because all of a sudden you learn how to talk to your clients, you're going to be successful. Don't think that all of a sudden, just because you start using Shine Supply, you're going to be successful or Gion or whatever brand that is. Don't think that just because all of a sudden you start doing these things, you're going to be successful. Brother, you got to do that shit day in, day <laughs> out, eat it, sleep it, drink it. You got to time you need yeah. time to do those things and execute it daily and then after a year you notice a little bit of traction after two years more traction four years more traction and then you wake up one day and you look back and you're like man i'm glad i've been doing that shit day in day out every single day of the week every week of the month and every month of the year because now look where i'm at but so you just can't fire up an Instagram page and start using all the fancy stuff and all of a sudden expect it to happen. So the trust comes over time and it comes through having very pointed conversations with your clients and being very direct on what to expect on the front side. I, I keep saying on the front side because if you wait till the back side, in other words, the end of the transaction that's where shit can get confusing and that's where the disconnect happens. Okay. So the more you are intertwined with them in the beginning and connected with them through the process, the better off you're going to be. But here's the other thing. This is, this is the final thought that I have on this is the one thing that I really pride myself on is communicating with our clients while we have their car. I'd say probably Half of our projects are multi-day projects because they're getting polished, coatings, PPF. You yeah. know, sometimes they get <clears> final <throat> work done, things like that. Sometimes it's half of our clients are a multi-day project. The other half is a one day. For the most part, we can do a one or a two-step paint correction, an interior, a motor. If we're not ceramic coating it and we're not doing PPF and it's not getting the windows tinted, it's literally just a traditional polish, protect, interior, that type. That's a one-day deal. Um <clears throat> But doesn't matter. Even if I only have their car one day, while we have those clients' vehicles, I communicate with them throughout 
the day or throughout the process. If we have the client's vehicle for one day, they'll hear from me two times. First time they hear from me is after we begin on the project I and I get a good idea for what's going on. If we can adhere to the service, in other words, if we're going to stick to what they ordered mm -hmm. or what we set up with the service, I verify with them, hey, what you ordered is doing great. This one-step polish is exactly what this car needed. I don't see the need for anything further. This is going awesome. Just wanted to give you a heads up. By the way, here's a before and after for you on something we've already okay. done on the car. I give them a photo or a video or something like that. Boom. We've only had their car for a few hours at this point. Boom. They're engaged. And that's a beautiful thing because now they feel – and I'll take, uh, let me backtrack just a little bit. The reason I do this is because I've always worked hard for my money. Always. I didn't have super rich parents. Nobody ever bought me a car. Um, you know, nothing like that. Everything that I've had, I've always earned. So every, because of that, because of the, 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 the cars and the things in my life that I've earned, if I ever let somebody work on something that I earn, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little yeah, nervous. I, can see I don't that. want somebody touching my shit. And so if I'm going to let somebody touch my shit, I want to know that everything's going okay and that everything is good. So that's the reason I do this. Okay. I'm, I, I got to make this point, man, because this has been huge for us. So, so a few hours in somebody that has given me the honor of touching their vehicle that they work for, I've now pulled them into the process. I've now made them feel a part of it. They know what's going on. They know everything's good. And I'm communicating with them to keep them in the loop. You got to remember, this person is spending hundreds, sometimes in a lot of cases, thousands of dollars with you to do something to their car. Yeah. We're a specialty service. Let's not forget yeah. that. Yes. Let's, let's be honest. <clears throat> if high-end detailers or if detailers in general fell off the face of the earth. If all of us died tonight in some <laughs> detailer apocalypse, guess what? <laughs> the world would still go on tomorrow. Let's be 100% honest yes. about that. Yes. What we do, nobody needs our shit. Nobody needs it. <laughs> People will live to see another day if we don't polish their car. Do you understand yes. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm picking I it think up. it's important that we realize that because – some detailers out there get this God complex, like nah, the world would die if I died. You know what I mean? And they think like they've got some holier than thou skill set that people should worship or something like that. So let's go back to the point. Once you realize that people don't need you, you might start operating your business at a different frequency. Oh. Once you realize that your clients don't have to have you and they will live another day, you might start treating them a little bit differently. So about three hours into having their car, I like to update them, let them know, okay. hey, everything's going great. Or let's say that vehicle's not going so great. I like to give them the opportunity to upgrade, upgrade. service at that point. Yeah. Hey, right now we are getting good results with a one-step polish. However, we are noticing all around the car uh, there's real heavy water scaling. And if you step up to our next level of correction, we can get that out. What do you want to do, Mr. Jones? And then give them the opportunity to say, hey, I understand what you're saying, but I need to keep it at a certain budget. So let's stick to the one-step polish. Okay. Or, hey, dang it, man, I was really hoping the one-step polish would get it, but I totally understand what you're saying. Let's go ahead and upgrade to the heavier level of correction. I want that problem fixed. Now we're here. Me and my client are here mm -hmm. instead of way over here. Oh. So that's the first time that they hear from me. The second time that they hear from me is typically after lunch, after we've worked on the car for several more hours. And now I can nail down a time in which they can pick up the car. So now if I thought I was going to be done at three o'clock or four o'clock, maybe that's not going to work because they upgraded service. So now it's going to be 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's when they hear from me. It, and that's on a one day service. If I have a vehicle for multiple days, they hear from me twice a day. They hear from twice me once day. in the early part of the day. So I can let them know what we're going to do for the day on their car. And then they hear from me at the very end of the day. So they know where we left off and what I have left to accomplish on the car. So every day, every client that we have hears from me two times about their automobile. 
that right there has been a game changer and what is what separates insane paint auto detailing from all the other people in town. And that's one of the reasons I use that hashtag, the insane experience, because I want it to be an experience when people work with us, not a God dang transaction. I don't want them to be like, Hey, I need to make an appointment. Okay. Here's your appointment. We're going to do this. Okay. Your car's done. Okay. Let me have your money. Okay. Have a good day. All right. Bye. <laughs> I don't want it to be a transaction. I want them to walk away going, I just gave that guy three grand to do polish and PPF and ceramic. And I feel good as hell about that shit. I want to do it again. I want to go make another three grand, go buy another $50,000 car and I'm do the same shit all over again. Cause I like that guy and I like his business and I like the way they operate. That was awesome. Yeah. That's how I want people to feel when they do business with us. And so how I do that, communicating expectations on the front side, communicating direction and results and, you know, how things are going during the process and then being authentic and being very grateful when they check out and when they ring up. Um, you know, I'm a handshaker, I'm a hugger. And right now with COVID, we're having to do a lot less of that, but I shake hands where I can, I hug mm -hmm. where I can. And when I can't do that, I do a whole lot of fist bumping. And <laughs> I also do a lot of this, you know, that emoji, like the grateful yeah. hands, like if I can't hug or fist bump or, you know, whatever handshake or whatever somebody meant, I, I do this and I look them dead in the eye and I just tell them, thank you so, 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 so much. Like that's so mm. important. And, um, I think people, I know this sounds weird, but I think people forget to be grateful, man. Like when you do a lot of work for somebody, like I think at the end of the day, you forget to be grateful. And so, um, those are a few of the little things that I do every day with these clients, every time we have a car and I've done it for eight freaking years. So, yeah, thank you for, thank you for that. Uh, I think I'm going to be starting doing that. I, I mean, I do that also, but I don't think I do that for every client. Uh, so I think a lot of shops here also in the Philippines now, I think a lot of shops, Oh, a lot of guys, a lot of detailers don't really do that. I mean, that's where they fail to build relationships with some of the clients. That's where they they kind of fail to build the trust with the with 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 a new client or whether it's an old or new client. Um, quick questions, quick question though, on top of your mind. Uh, worst client, worst client ever. Who? Who was it or how did you handle it? What was the car? If you still remember it, though. <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know, I don't think I necessarily have a worst client situation. Um, like nobody has ever really, you know, I don't want to say treated us badly, but nobody has really um complain negatively you know said anything bad or did anything bad or was overly obnoxiously ridiculously hard to work with um yeah i don't know that i have like a super specific answer on that but I'll tell you what I do have a comment about in that vein is let me start it with this comment. Do the hard shit. Okay. Do the hard stuff. Do it. Do the hard stuff. When you have a difficult client, cause I, I kind of know where your head's at and I know, I know what you mean by asking that question, but if you have a client that is difficult to work with. Let's say they're overly, I don't want, I don't know what word to use other than picky. Let's say they're overly picky, overly compulsive with what they expect, um, you know, their car to, to, to look like or be like or whatever. Um, or a client that 
is very uneducated that you're having to, but they have a million questions at the same time. You're having to explain everything to, or let's say you have a vehicle that is fighting you in every way possible. Like let's say you're doing a wheels off detail and you get a lug nut that's stuck on and now you got to, you know, cut off the lug stud or whatever, get like, that's a hassle. And then the next thing you do on the vehicle, it's messed up. And then the next thing you do on the vehicle, it's messed up. It's like this nightmare project where every time you try to do something, something goes wrong or it's just fighting you or whatever is the thing that I would say about those moments um, is they're trying to teach you something. And so whether it's a super gnarly, difficult client to work with, because, the expectations or the questions or whatever are just not matching up and you're, it's just super difficult to work with them. And they're, you know, maybe they're, you know, they're not at your shop the whole time, but the whole time they're texting, Hey, how's it coming? Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's it look like? Hey, Hey, is this, 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 or, you know, they're just all over you about your car while you have it. Or if you have a project that is just fighting you every step of the way and has be become, you know, what you thought was going to be a neat project has just become a total complete pain in the ass. Yeah. yeah um, I've had my shit. The, the thing, yeah, the <laughs> thing that I would say about those things is that they are trying to teach you something. And I reference this thought process and this mindset in a lot of my posts is that when I first started and when I first had these few guys on my team these years ago, these first people that joined up with me and then, you know, they left and they bad mouthed me or said I was bad or, you know, whatever it was, or I went through a difficult, you know, uh, uh, interaction with a client or whatever. I have learned so much from those and those things used to drag me down and they used to bother me and they used to clutter my mindset and I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd be saddened by them or they would be distracting to me for the longest time. And now none of those things distract me. None of them bother me. I, every time the littlest thing, whether I'm even installing PPF and it's not going the way that I want or um, the paint correction is not going the way that I want, or I messed up with a client and, you know, maybe expectations weren't met or something yeah. like that. Or let's say it's a car that I didn't do and, and, and the team did all by themselves and, and we overlooked something there. Um, whatever it might be, I immediately, my mindset now, and it's been this way for a few years, it's like a switch flipped with me a few years ago. I look at those moments now like I'm supposed to gain something from this. I'm supposed to learn I look at it now and go, what is my freaking lesson? Like, what am I supposed to learn from this moment? Um, so my mindset has changed. And so I, I know that's n maybe not the answer you were looking for, but I, I don't have a standout <laughs> moment with a client where I was like, Oh my God, there's one time, remember there's this one time where this one guy, I don't, I don't have that. Um, yeah. So I don't have an answer on that, but I would just encourage you that every time you feel like you're having a bad day or a bad client interaction or a bad project, or it's just a bad week, maybe you're just having a bad week, maybe something your whole week, maybe you're on Thursday and you're like, man, I haven't had a good day this week. Shit has just been bad. I would just tell you to really look at that and dissect it and try to figure out what you're supposed to be learning and what you can gain from that. Because if you're not getting strength from the struggle, then you're not looking at it the right way. And your perception of doing business is wrong. You're not, everything's not supposed to be all fluffy and fantastic and good and go perfect all the yeah. time. So relish in the moments when it does go good, but in the times when shit sucks, go, okay, I'm supposed to be getting stronger from this. Where is my lesson? So that, I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but that's the answer that I have. So deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on, moving on. Uh, I do want to ask you, how do you, how do you deal with competition? I mean, uh, you, I, I've read some of your posts. You don't necessarily pay attention to competition. Hey, what now? I, I'm having a tough time hearing hello, you. Hello. Say that one more time. Uh, 
how do you how do you handle competition with another shop another brand or uh, basically the other detailers in your area who's not necessarily your friend or not necessarily someone you know but how do you handle that whether it's friendly competition or sometimes maybe a hostile competition uh, how do you handle those things well i've got a two part answer for that <clears throat> okay i've got a two part answer for my first three years, for my first three to four years, somewhere in there, I had a huge chip on my shoulder. Not because I was angry, but because I wanted all of it. I wanted all the business. I wanted every car in my city and in my area to come to me. I, I wanted all of it. To me, there was no competition. Nobody was doing it the way that we could do it. Nobody looked like us, sounded like us, worked like us, hustled like us, grinded like us. Nobody was like us. I wanted all of it. I wanted all of it. <laughs> and so I acted as if. I, 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 I did. I, I didn't want to give a penny to anybody else. So the way that I hustled, the hours that I worked, the way that I sacrificed, the choices that I made, the, the way that I posted on social media, I was the end all be all like, you just, you got to bring your car to me. There's no competition, all of that. And back then <clears throat> there was people detailing, but there really was no, nobody doing paint correction and coatings and things like that. By the time we kind of hit our stride, nobody was, nobody was doing that stuff. So <clears throat> there, there was, there might've been one or two people, but on a very small, quiet, innocent level, they weren't near as hungry as I was. Right. So that was my answer back then over the past few years, as things have changed and we've evolved and our team has grown. Um, it's, it's a different answer. I now no BS. I now give away to a few detailers that we collaborate with. There's about three or four guys that I'm very close with. Um, I give away probably about $5,000 a month in business. I literally refer them to other people. I do. Um, I never would have done that in my early years. I never would have done that. I would have figured out a way to say yes and to make something happen rather than give it to somebody else. Now, a few things have changed for me on a personal level over the past few years. My kids are now old enough to where my interactions and my role as a father need to be much more prominent. The way that I am raising my two sons not that it wasn't important when they were little infants and babies, but when they're little infants and babies and stuff like that, they need their mother. They, they yeah. do. They need their mother more than they need their father. I'm not saying that my influence doesn't have a say so, but I could still be a, a good father at that age in their life. And I, I didn't have to be as home as much. I could work more. Yeah. Well, now that they're getting older and they're becoming mm -hmm. humans um, and they're developing their life. I, there's a much larger role and lessons that I need to be teaching them. And so I need to be more present. So when I used to be working, you know, 80 to a hundred hours a week, that no longer makes sense to me anymore. I now need to work a 50 to 60 is still fairly normal. I'm still working. Yeah. I'm easily working 60 hours a week. No doubt about that. So I would say now I'm more in the 60 to 70 range. So that's still uh -huh. a lot of hours, but yeah. I'm also still able to, play a much stronger role in their life as a father. I'm, this yeah. this is answering the competition answer yeah. for you. But so my, my, the second part of my competition answer is in the early, in the early years, I never would have given a penny to anybody else. It, it was me, only me, the team, us, whoever was working here at the time. It, it, that's it. That's, I'm not giving anybody anything else. I wasn't giving up a single inch. Now, because my role as a father has changed and my time with my family is more valuable, there are certain jobs that I have to let go of because my time with my family is more important. And I'd rather be at home with my family rather than say yes to this job and stay till midnight or one or two or 3 a.m. and work on it. 
Now, if you're an individual that doesn't have kids and your hunger level is through the roof, by all means, work those 80 to 100 hour work weeks. Say yes to every job. Work in that last minute client that you're trying to squeeze in because you don't want to give anything away to your competition. Okay. Now, this has kind of a multitude of an answer for you because, you know, as far as taking the business or giving the business to somebody else, that's kind of one answer to competition. The, that's the friendly part of it, right? Okay. So these guys that we give the business to, I love working with them. They're stand-up individuals. They do quality work. I love working with them. We're an authorized shine supply dealer, so they'll come down and get supplies they're real friendly with our team. Like it's a community. It is a community and a family energy to that, to that circle. To the people that are outside of that circle, the unfriendly competition, I'm the type of guy where I will always give somebody the benefit of the doubt, even if at first they don't give me the benefit of the doubt. So there was a guy in town several years ago that started talking crap on me before I even ever met him before I ever even spoke with him, before I ever got a chance to shake his hand. He's just an <laughs> odd son of a bitch that opened his mouth on the wrong guy. And <laughs> so from the beginning, he set the precedent that he just didn't like me, he didn't like my shop, what we stood for, the work we were doing, blah, blah. He thought he was king dingling. And so that mm. was really tough. And so I had to navigate through that. And now we're absolutely crushing everything and anything that he does. So turnabout's fair play. Karma's a bitch. He can't <laughs> hold a candle to what we do now. So I bet he wishes he would have had a different tone of voice seven years ago when he started talking about me. So there's that. But other than that, um, I, I think how to, uh, this is what I would say on the unfriendly part of it. On the unfriendly competition, no differently than on when you're trying to dictate expectations to your clients, you want to have those conversations on the front side. I think on the front side of competition, if you are a good human being, if you are a, a very nice person, you conduct yourself professionally. And, and I don't mean just on social media. I mean in the dark of it. I mean when you're sitting at a restaurant having dinner and drinks with a friend, you talk about the other competing businesses in the area in a positive fashion. Or, you know, they say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Don't Maybe you don't all. speak on those people at all. Maybe just saying nothing is the right thing. Or if you do have something to say, you say it professionally and you say it cordially. And I think if you as the business owner of your domain, of your community, if you're saying the right things and nice things and being professional and being integrous and carrying yourself in a, in a very noble fashion amongst your community of detailers, if by the off chance something comes up about you in a negative fashion, well, then guess who looks like the asshole? The person that said it. Because people know you and the way that you carry yourself and they know that you're rooted in integrity and because they know that you carry yourself in a very honest fashion, they're not going to take what that other person said, said about you with a grain of salt. Like they're just, they're going to write it off and be like, you know what? You can say what you want about Tristan. Uh, I know him. and that's a good dude, man. Like, so say what you want to say, but I, I still like Tristan. I'm still going to do business with Tristan, you know, so whatever, you know, your clients or your friends or whoever it is that's hearing that will know better. You know, there's that goofy old saying that real eyes recognize real yeah. eyes. <laughs> yes, and yes. so I think if you carry yourself in the proper fashion, the people that say bad things about you, it only sheds even more of a negative light on them. On them. And the other yeah. thing that you have to realize is that if somebody has the time to negatively say something about you, then they're not busy. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Let's just be honest. They're not busy. <laughs> if they've got enough time to talk shit about you, whether it's, oh, he charges too much or he doesn't charge enough and he his work is shit or whatever. If they've got enough time to say stuff like that about you, then chances are they're 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 not they're not, they're not very busy. 
And and, and, and and here's what I always find too. The person that says negative, that ha that has the audacity or the character to say something bad about somebody else like that, they themselves are hurting. And they're taking those insecurities and what they're feeling badly about in here and they're projecting it onto somebody else because they're too nervous to fix their own shit. Mm -hmm. And so instead of it's harder for that individual to fix their own problems and what's going on in their heart, their head or their business, it's a lot more difficult for them to fix themselves. And so instead of doing that, they're looking for somebody to blame or point a finger at. And that's why I feel like competition can get a negative energy to it. And it's unfortunate. So whatever side of that fence that you're on to anybody listening to this or watching this, if you're on the negative side of it, be man enough to send the DM or pick up the phone or go by the person's shop that you said the negative stuff about and squash that BS and be the big enough man to bury the hatchet and go, Hey man, I need to tell you something. That was me that said that stuff a year ago and I shouldn't have said it. And I'm sorry because I would much rather get along with you and be your friend and be your colleague and have us grow together than have this crap exist between us. Be the bigger man. If you were big enough to talk shit, be big enough to go bury and squash that deal. And if you can't, then you get to live the rest of your life as a coward. So enjoy that. Good luck with that. I wish you all the best. If you're on the positive side of that, of that, of that bad competition, stay on the positive side of it. Just because that other person is saying bad things about you or has in the past, um, don't be the one to then only further instigate a civil war. Let them say what they want to say. Let them do what they want to do. Because 10 years from now, five years from now, there will be a difference in the businesses. I'm yeah. just telling you. No, there are yeah. guys that when they left working with me and they left and they talked crap on me and they went and started their own thing, they're not even in business anymore. <laughs> they're not in business anymore. They didn't even make it three or four years. They're shut down. Oh, well. let, let the manhood do the talking. Let the business do the talking. Let the, let the strength do the talking. Sometimes you don't have, sometimes your, your best superpower is saying nothing at all because in time people will learn. People will learn. There are people that used to be clients of mine that when those people left and started those businesses, they left working with me and they went to go do business with that person. I know those people now see that I'm still around and those people aren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Makes that sense. Is, Makes that's sense. the old, I didn't even need to say anything that like that, the, the unspoken word says more volume. So if you're on the positive side of that bad competition, stay on the positive side of it because the person saying the things that they're saying or making the claims that they're making is just doing it because they're scared to work on themselves and they need to blame you for something. Yeah. Makes sense. Dude. Period. Yeah. Okay. I'm down to my last question. This is my last question. Okay. okay. Uh, it's where here in the Philippines, this is kind of a gray area where, where some shops, I mean, some guys uh, don't really well, here's the thing about the IDA uh, accreditation thing. It's not yet big here in the Philippines. I'm sure it's bigger there in the USA. What what can you say about that? It's is it a good thing or is it just uh, another money making um, machine? Well, uh, so I look at it uh, this way. So it, it is kind of big here, but we're not IDA certified. No, I don't have that plaque on my wall. Me too. Me too. Um, yeah. So um, now, now I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Um, there are a lot of people that I have a very high respect for and they are IDA certified. Um, so, I, you know, I look at it a couple of different ways. Like, for example, like here in the United States, I don't I don't know what it's like in the Philippines, but there's an accreditation for mechanics. Um, mm -hmm. 
ASE, an ASE certification. I forget what the ASE stands for. I think it stands for Automotive Service Excellence. I could be wrong on that. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong on that. <laughs> but ASE is a very high standard. If you're an ASE certified mechanic here in the United States, that means you've paid some dues. That means you're a very highly skilled technician. And so, and, it, and it's a technique, it's a, um, it's a certification that you have to continually earn. I'm not sure if it's yearly. I wish I, I could answer that more a, a little bit better on the ASE, but it's, if you go to get your car worked on and the mechanic that does the work is ASE certified, that gives you a little bit of peace of Confidence, mind. Yeah. So I'm not saying that. And I, so I know that the IDA was invented to kind of give that same, um, um, authentication to to the detailing uh, profession. I know that's why the IDA was put in place. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Um, I think you could look at it a couple of different ways. Number one, if you're looking at it from a perspective of, I want to have that on my wall because when people walk in my shop, I want them to see that and feel more comfortable or feel more at ease with them giving me the keys to their car. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, I think that that's, I think that can be good. I think it's just another tool in the tool belt for you to say, Hey, I've made it. And I want my clients to understand that I've put in the work and I've earned my stripes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So if that's your reason behind it, I think that could be absolutely fantastic, especially if you're a newer business. Yeah. Um, see, the IDA, at least I didn't learn about it anyway until like, I think probably three or four years ago. So for the first three or four years of my business, I don't, if it was around eight years ago, I didn't know about it. If it was around eight years ago, if I would have known it was around eight years ago, I might have wanted it for that exact reason. It would have been another check mark on my wall when my clients came in, and I probably would have wanted that. By the time I learned that the IDA was a thing, or by the time it was invented, I was so heavy in momentum of growth of insane paint, and I was already so ingrained in who I was and what I stood for and how I conducted my business, that I didn't need it. I didn't need somebody else to tell me that I'm good enough. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, for me, it hasn't made sense to, to take the test or whatever it is that you've got to do to become IDA certified. And maybe I will eventually because, you know, maybe I'll be bored one day and I'll have time to fill out <laughs> the application and take the test and we'll <laughs> knock it out and just do it just to do it. But so if you're this, this is typically always going to be my answer on questions like this. If I'm doing it for my clients, hell yes, you should do it. If you're doing it to have clout to brag online, you shouldn't even be doing what you're doing. You shouldn't be a detailer in the first place. Yeah. You're because you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Yes. So don't get IDA certified because you want to be a badass on Instagram and make some cool post about how you you know, how cool you are, do it because you want to prove that you've earned your keep and you've earned the right to, to run a high level, efficient business for the sake of your clients. So I think the perception of why you would want that in the first place is important. And I think, you know, who you're doing the IDA certification for or any certification for that matter, you know, whether you go to our training or you go to train with shine supply mm. or you go to train with any of the other high level detailers in the United States, um, mm. you know, or you get certified from a coding installer accredited from G technic or whatever it might be. Um, you know, do it for the right reasons, not to get clout, um, or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I think it can be a great tool. Um, but I don't, I, I also don't think that it's a hundred percent necessary for certain individuals. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I can see it from both ways. I think, <laughs> I think the person who is seeking the, the certification from anybody, whether it's IDA or coding installer or whatever, 
I think the person seeking it needs to decide for them why it's important. Mm -hmm. And then once they figure that out, they can answer their own question as to whether or not they need that certification. So, yeah. Well, I've always told my, my friends, my colleagues, now, if I've ever had a chance to go to the, U to the U.S. and get somebody to train me, I would, have, I would, have, I would go with, with you guys. I would train under you guys. And there's this other guy, Keith Richards, Richardson. You know yeah, him? Yeah, Kids, uh, yeah. I'm very, very much interested in training with you and him. Those are the two top two priorities that I would... Really love to oh, learn shit, from. man. That's crazy. Yeah, Keith is a good <laughs> dude. He's a good human being too. Keith is, he's he's a, he's he's got a good soul. So yeah, I could tell even with uh with his Instagram page. I really love the the materials that he posts. He somewhat resembles you guys in some ways. Uh, although I understand he works solo. I think he works by himself. Sometimes he has yeah. help or what, but but. I really admire those guys who really do things their own way. They're, they're working on their own and they're really running the business. I can see it. As they're, they're actually, you guys are actually doing it for, for you, not for your clients, not for the money and everything. But, well, those are the side benefits. But you're basically right. doing the job that you love and you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for any other reason at all. So... That's Absolutely. that's my point point of view in that. Okay, uh, I think I'm about ready to wrap it up. I do love the 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 signboard you have uh, uh, in your back uh, that basically sums up <laughs> basically sums up everything that we talked about. Uh, my mindset, the only word that you can change. Now, yes, uh, I love the I love your quotes. I love your your phrases that you post on social media. I do want to thank you, Rebs, Rebs. Bye now. I do want to man I, pre you. I appreciate you guys man hey buddy <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate wanna... you guys this was this was very cool man thank you so much for uh, inviting me thank you for taking the time I'm sure you're a very very busy guy and I woke you up your it's what time is it there it's now I think it's now eight o'clock eight 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 something or nine o'clock there uh yeah it's a little after nine I actually just had a client show up to pick up <laughs> his vehicle so that this works so, out perfect <laughs> thank you for taking the time thank you for taking the time to thank uh, to talk with us now we, we we are huge fans and I'm sure you hear this a lot and I really love your work and I hope me and Rebs we get a chance to visit America soon and we can we can visit your shop I love the the huge wall you have there the one with the no shortcuts no handouts I love yes. it. If only we had a wall here to put something like that also. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, thank you, man. It's really, really. Man, I, I really appreciate, appreciate you guys. This was, this was an honor for me as well. I never imagined that I'd be connecting with somebody in the Philippines that would actually give two craps about what I had to say. <laughs> so this was mind-blowing and, and very, very fun for me as well. It's so very good to meet you guys. I know we've communicated here and there yeah. off and on for the past couple of years. And so yes. it's really nice to put a face to the name. And I'm just, I'm very, very grateful. And if you guys ever come to the United States, yes. I'm paying for your hotel. There's a hotel right wow. here by our shop. <laughs> it's I'll, I'll pay for the hotel and we can, wow. we can grind on a few cars over a few days together and we'll, we'll, yeah, well, we'll create when's, something special. So when's thank the you. Next, uh, when's the next uh, shine showdown? I, I understand it's an event. Um, I don't know. So. Um, you know, we typically hold it in the fall. It's usually in October because mm -hmm. in Alabama, it's very hot late into the year. Um, our temperatures just started dropping not too long ago. So we usually hold it in October. So it's a little bit cooler and not so sweltering hot. So mm -hmm. I don't have a date yet, but it's usually in late October. So Okay. So yeah, maybe if we go there, we'll kind of fix the timing up a little bit and maybe we'll make it to your next event. That'd be awesome. <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, brother. You guys have All a right. good weekend. I appreciate y'all. You, you too. Good luck. Okay, good man. Luck. See ya. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.